reading is Matthew 14, verses 22 through 32. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked in the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Thank you. One of the things that we know is how our experiences with God build one upon the other. So what you're experiencing now is a building block of what you will experience later on, and that builds upon this and upon this and upon this. And God uses these things. Nothing is wasted. Remember, even after he feeds all those people, he tells the disciples, he says, now you go out there and you collect everything that's left over. Why? Because nothing's ever wasted with God. Nothing. And God does this to strengthen us. They see, that's the goal of God, for you to be strong, for you to have deep roots in Christ, for you to be strong in the Lord and the power of his strength. And this will, what, this, this improves our interaction with God. You know, as you, as you grow in Christ, you become more um, less afraid of God and more aware of God. You know the ways of God and, and you are able to interact with God in better in a, in a greater way. But also with one another. You see how it works. And it fulfills the, the great commandment. Loving God and loving your neighbor. Well, what this says to us, here's a principle, being consistent matters. Your consistency in your walk with the Lord, it matters. So rate yourself, all right? On a one to 10 scale, how consistent is your walk with the Lord? Now be honest, be honest about it. Rate yourself one to 10. Where are you in terms of your walk with the Lord? How consistent are you with your walk? Well, last week we, we looked at what is taking place in the lives of the disciples of Jesus as they experience so much of him. Where they see things that he's doing when he where they hear things that he's teaching and, and they're experiencing so much of Jesus. And this, these things are nothing short of supernatural things. I mean, who is he? That's the question. Who is he? It is what they are working out. You know, the Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what it means is that you're, you're figuring out that I, I was trying to figure it out. When I came to Christ, when I was around 20 years old, that was a long time ago. And I was, I, I tried to figure out when I first started, what is, who is he? Who is he to me? What is, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, that's what's happening to these guys. They are trying to work it out. They're working out their salvation with fear and trembling. You know, to them, at the start of the journey with Jesus, you know, Jesus was just like John the Baptist to them. They hadn't seen anything. 
There were no miracles that had taken place. Jesus was just like John the Baptist. He was a prophet. He was, he was a teacher. In fact, some of the disciples had been mentored by John the Baptist. And John, seeing Jesus, says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Follow him. And so they leave John and they follow Jesus, but they don't know anything about him. Nothing. They had probably never seen him before. And now they're starting to follow Jesus. Not knowing very much at all about who he really is. Not much, but as they begin to experience more and more of Jesus, experiencing God, as they are listening, as they are watching, as they're being consistent, they begin to grow. They grow and their uncertainty begins to fade away over time. And who he is and what he is begins to deepen within their soul. That's how it works. Consistency is important. Don't take it for granted. That's how it works. It's what God wants to do in us. He wants to deepen our walk with him. I've been a Christian for 53 years. 50, 50, yeah, 53 years. 53 years. Wow. I'm probably as old as your dad. I mean, I've been walking with the... Is your dad 48 or something? Come on. He's looking at me going, man, that's an old man. When I, I had the opportunity to plant a church, and that, you know, I always say for a seasoned pastor to plant a church is great fun and great privilege, and I got to do that. And I was like 54, 55 years old. So I'm at a meeting with these young guys, these young church planters, right? And I'm sitting here and two of them are over here and they're talking to one another and they're talking about this old guy. I'm sitting there. I'm going, am I invisible? And so they're, they're talking about this old guy. And one of them says, yeah, he's 40. <laughs> so I slapped them both <laughs> in my heart. But I, I want to say this. This is what I know for, for certain. I've been walking with the Lord for 53 years. But when I started off my life with Jesus, I, I didn't know much. Didn't know much at all. But this is what I know. That, that as you're walking with the Lord, I can say personally, I know much more about him now. Much, much more about him now, personally, over the years, this has changed. It's grown deeper and deeper and deeper, my personal relationship with Jesus. Much more than when I started off. Much, much more. See, here's, this is a reality. Some Christians say, I came to Christ 20 years ago. And, and sadly, they were stronger then than they are now. You know people like that? I do. They were so on fire for Jesus 20 years ago. Man, they wore Jesus buttons. They were just following him and sharing Jesus. But, but they, 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 somehow when they started growing older, they became more inconsistent. In their walk with him. They were more mature back then. Don't let that be said of you. Don't let it be said of you. Today I want to I want to finish up what we started last week. I want to talk about what happened to the disciples as a result of Jesus walking on the water. Those guys had witnessed a lot up to that point in time. But this miracle will become for them one of the most influential 
One of the most informative miracles. One of the most instructive, as we shall see. And as you know, they witnessed quite a lot of what Jesus had done. So to get most out of this account, we need to go from John's gospel to Matthew's gospel. We talked about John. John gives us so little details about it, about Jesus walking on the water. And we said last week that, John, you know, John is not the detailed person that Matthew is. Now, how do we know? How do we know for certain? We know this for certain. You know how we know? Because Matthew writes 28 chapters and John only 21. So if John wrote like a biography on Jesus, it'd be like this. Matthew's, it'd be like this. Matthew is so detailed. And we, and we love that about both of them. They're, they're different. So that's why reading these Gospels together is so important. And in 14, Matthew, he goes into detail to give us a timeline of what happened when Jesus walks on the water. And before this happened, Herod, you know, he's a terrible person. Herod, who's the tetrarch or governor of the Galilee, Israel was divided into four parts, and he's over the top part, the Galilean part, the largest part of Israel. And this guy has John the Baptist, right before this happens, he has John the Baptist put to death, which, by the way, he wanted to do. He wanted to put John the Baptist, just not like it happened. But the Bible says that he wanted to have him put to death. All along, he wanted to kill John, but he, according to Matthew, he didn't because he was afraid of what the people would do if he did it. The people believed that John was a prophet, but he has him executed. That's the timeline. Herod is now hearing about Jesus. Jesus is now replacing John in terms of popularity. He's becoming more and more of a celebrity among the people because unlike John, who didn't do one miracle, Jesus is doing them all over the place. And he's hearing about Jesus doing lots of them. And old Herod, you know what he thinks? He thinks that the reason is because Jesus might be called Jesus by the people, but who he really is, old Herod is thinking he's John the Baptist who's come back to life, risen from the dead. Crazy, right? Crazy. Can we just say that, you know, that sometimes if the guilt can make you crazy. Guilt can make you crazy. People that are guilty, they just, you, you, you lose a sense of sanity. And that's what's the, the good news of the gospel is, man, you can get rid of that stuff. You can get rid of it. You confess your sin to Christ, he will forgive you and cleanse your heart of all unrighteousness. Or guilt can make you crazy. And he was. So after Jesus hears about John the Baptist's death, they were, they were second cousins. John the Baptist and Jesus were second cousins. Elizabeth, John's mama, and Mary, Jesus' mama, cousins. And so his second cousin, who's the forerunner, who Jesus said among women that he's the greatest of all who have been born of woman. This guy's an amazing guy, Jesus said, about his, this second cousin of his. And so here he finds out that he's been beheaded, killed. And so Jesus withdraws and he withdraws because he needs time. He needs to deal with this, deal with the grief. And some of the disciples of Jesus, at least four or five of them, have been followers of John the Baptist. They walked with John. They were mentored by John. And now their mentor has been murdered. They need time. 
And so Jesus says, all right, come on, let's go. And so they, they go and they're resting and they're, that was the intention. And they, to hear reports because he had sent them out to do uh, on mission, to do some things. They did some things. They taught. They bring back this report. John's been killed. They need time together. They may have been away for a few months. And now they're together again. But they're seen. Literally thousands of people come to where he is. And Jesus feeds all those people, the 5,000 men, women and children, maybe up to 20,000 people. He just does this. He just feeds them. After this, he sends the multitude away. And he also sent the disciples away, planning on, you know, rendezvousing at a certain place. And this is what happened. So the disciples are sent off and they encounter the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus comes to them walking on the water. They think it's a ghost and they in a panic. I mean, the storm was scary, but seeing Jesus, seeing something, they don't know what it is. Walking on the water, hair just filled with water. I mean, just dripping. They see this specter walking on the water and they are more terrified of that. Of course, I would. Yeah, yesterday I was here at the church and I, I come here and I preach to the, to you that are not here yet. And, um, uh, just edit my sermon. I get it in my heart and think about it. And you know what? I heard this noise. I did. I heard this. I thought it was somebody upstairs. I said, Oh my gosh, there's somebody living up there. Cause it sound, it was in this room. I went outside. It was a freaking red-headed woodpecker <laughs> pounding on this thing. It scared me. Well, the, 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 the sight of this thing walking closer to them terrified them. In 1427, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. It is I. Well, Peter says, Lord, if Lord, if it is you, Peter calls him Lord. I think this is, to my knowledge, the first time Peter does this, calls him Lord. Lord is an important word. What he calls him is important. It, it, it's a word to describe someone who is powerful. It's like, do you, did anybody see Downton Abbey and the Lord of Downton Abbey? And well, they're powerful people. Well, this, he calls him Lord because he's powerful and, and Jesus has authority. I mean, he's seen him feed people. He's seen him heal people. He, this, this, this is what Lord means. His authority and he's the ruler. He's the master. In Matthew 8, a leper calls him Lord, showing Jesus respect because Jesus heals and he, he wants Jesus to heal him. And there was this lady who was a Canaanite in 15th chapter of John. And, oh no, Matthew, Matthew. And he, uh, he call, she calls out because her daughter is demon possessed. And she wants Jesus to release the daughter from demons. You know, people can be demon possessed. That, that's a reality. People can be. So Peter says in 14, 28 to 33, we'll roll that on the screen. You'll see this. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. Command me. Now we said this. Jesus has fed thousands. And that, that you know, that will open your mind that will open your heart. He's, he's fed thousands. Along with the other things that he did is starting to have an influence on them. Of course it is. Why would Peter get out of the boat if those things hadn't influenced him? Right? Of course not. 
So what do we see? These guys are in a process. They're in a process of their faith starting to develop some strength. Now imagine, they're with Jesus. You're not with Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwells every believer. But these guys are with Jesus, experiencing firsthand the things that he does. And they're in this process of developing strength. Their faith developing strength. And that's how it happens. That's how it happens after our conversion, after that experience, we start the process of our faith in Jesus, in Him, in His Word, in the person of Christ, in the person of the Father, the work and person of the Holy Spirit. You start, the minute you're converted, you start the process of spiritual development. That's all discipleship is. Spiritual development. No one has strong faith when they are born again. No. Our faith is weak. And those guys are starting to develop stronger faith in Jesus Christ. In Him. In His teaching. How? As they experience Him. Their faith increases as they are experiencing God their faith grows but they have a ways to go that's what we see they have a ways to go here here's a principle the longer The longer you walk with Jesus Christ, the longer, the stronger you will grow in Jesus Christ. The longer you're walking, the stronger your walk. It's just a principle. And we see this. We see it. You, you know one of the biggest mistakes churches make? I'm going to tell you. They, they find this young guy who is real talented. He can speak very well. But he hasn't been really walking with the Lord that long. And so the church says, you know what? We need a young pastor. If we have a young preacher, we're going to attract young people. And so we hire the young pastor. We lay hands on this young guy, and he's now the young pastor pastor of the church. This is what I believe. I believe the church in America is declining, and it is. Not in other parts of the world, but it here, is here in America. This is why I think part of it, part of the reason isn't because pastors are too old. It's because some are too young. When you replace me, assassinate me or get rid of me or how fire me and uh, you know however it happens don't lay hands on someone who's too young in the Lord just don't even down the road don't do it because you'll say well we need to, we need to reach younger people and you need a, you need a young pastor to reach younger people but you need a young person who's strong in the Lord Mature in Christ. The longer you walk with Christ Jesus, the stronger you grow in Christ Jesus. Now what we're starting to see is disciples are, are starting to get, their, to get their understanding of Christ. They're starting to develop somewhat. But their faith has room to grow. After Jesus did the miracle of the feeding of the thousands, do you see what he's now doing? Or he fed them. Now what is he up to? He launched the disciples out 
in the boat. Why? In order for the next lesson to begin. See, you, you will go from experience to experience, but this experience is the next lesson in order for you to grow. That's what's happening here. It's the next lesson begins in order to test their faith. That's what James says. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials or testing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, what is endurance? Endurance is strength for the long haul. So they're off rowing and Jesus goes off praying. See, Jesus has planned this learning session for the fellas. Peter, I love this guy. We're a lot alike, me and Peter. I wish I was more like Paul. Carter is more like Paul, isn't he? He is like Paul. He is crazy like Paul, but smart like Paul. I'm more like Peter. Listen to that. My wife will say amen to that. He's a little bit crazy. He's uh, enthusiastic. And he says, look, it, Lord, if it, he didn't say look. He said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. His faith in Jesus, who's on the water himself, is pretty strong at that time. And he takes one step, two steps, three steps, baby steps, I'm sure, of faith. But it didn't last very long, right? Kind of like, you know, your canister with your gas grill. Doesn't that drive you crazy? You're cooking the burgers. All of a sudden, it's poof, 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 flickering. And then poof, the flame is gone. Out of gas. Well, Peter, Peter, it's like that. Peter's faith was like that canister. See, he probably thinks he is stronger than he really is. And boy, will he discover the hard way he was weaker than he had assumed. Christians do this a lot. Don't overestimate your strength. Don't do that. We say, well, I'm strong enough to handle this. I can handle this relationship with this person. I can handle it. My faith is strong enough. But all of a sudden, you find yourself giving into temptation that you had never planned on taking part of in your whole life. Or you connect with someone in a business deal. I'm a Christian. I can handle this. Because you think that your faith is strong enough to handle it. We are not faith equipped to handle temptation alone. We think we can. There was a young fellow I was in college with, and he said, I can handle going to this religion course with this professor at Western Carolina who was a flaming liberal. The guy was left of mouth. That's how liberal he was. He was the most liberal professor I'd ever, anybody had ever been under. And we don't, don't, don't sit under this guy. Oh, I can handle it. He couldn't handle it. And at the end of the semester, he lost his faith, broke fellowship with us, was gone. He thought he could handle it, and he couldn't. Peter's faith was like the gas grill. It gave out. He was out of gas. How does it happen? It happens when he takes his eyes off of Jesus. When he unplugs from Jesus. His faith that he thought was strong in him was weak faith. Gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And he begins to sink into the water. He takes his eyes off of Christ. Stops trusting in the Lord. And then it happens. That's how it happens. It's how it'll happen to you. 
if you're not careful. Then Peter, in serious trouble, he cries out, Jesus, save me, and he does. And looking at Peter, Jesus says to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, here's, here's the ending. Here's the end of the sermon. Here's the lesson from the text. Of course, if we take our eyes off Jesus and focus on whatever is going on in our lives, are you doing that? Our problems will overwhelm what faith we have and w the weight of our problems will sink us as Christians. They sink us. Doubt is the result of taking our eyes off and trusting in Jesus. Faith is the result of trusting in Jesus. By keeping his eyes on Jesus, Peter would have risen above his circumstances. His faith would have lifted him up. We even say, we even say when we make this excuse, we say, well, under the circumstances. No. No. What are we doing under the circumstances? We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Are you doing that? When Peter lets doubt replace his faith in Jesus, life got worse not better. It never gets better. It gets worse. Peter has a lot to learn, and so do we. All the brothers in the boat have a lot to learn. Now, what to do? Hey, keep your eyes on Jesus. By developing holy habits, times alone with God every day, in His Word, in prayer, staying connected, Staying plugged in. Being consistent. Amen? That's how it works. That's how it works. Father, we thank you for this simple teaching. It's a reminder for most of us. We've, we've heard this before. This is nothing new. And so, Lord, we just come before you. We ask you to help us to embrace this truth. To... Um, if, if we rated ourselves and we say, you know, I'm like a two or three when it comes to being consistent. I hardly ever have a quiet time. In fact, if I'm honest, I really don't have quiet times with the Lord. I'm not in the Word every day. I'm not praying every day. I'm not uh, in fellowship. I'm not consistent in my church attendance. God, I am a two or a three. And it's the reason why my faith is so weak. And so, Lord, today I repent by turning to you and admitting I have been inconsistent. And I ask you to forgive me. Just ask him to forgive you. And then tomorrow, begin developing a daily time with the Lord. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In his name. Amen.